From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. Wednesday the 11th, 3 p.m. in London, 10 a.m. in New York. We're 30 minutes into the trading day in the United States. From London, I'm Guy Johnson, Alex Steele over in New York. Welcome, everybody, to Bloomberg Markets. Alex, equities, fresh record highs, inflation, not so much. Yep. Nope, we didn't get Godot. That was kind of my takeaway from the inflation number. Markets are kind of prep for something to happen and well, nothing happens. So obviously you can see a yield pretty much then going nowhere, giving back any of their uh, gains from earlier. Uh, you do have a record high for the S&P, but it's the value trade, it's financials, utilities, it's also materials that are leading the way. A tech pretty much goes nowhere. The Nasdaq 100 doing relatively well. You're not getting a big move in yields. You're not going to get a big move in tech either. What did move, though, Guy, uh, was the dollar. The Bloomberg dollar index kind of sank like a stone, now down by about uh, one-tenth of one percent. But still, I would call all of this action relatively muted. Um, the one area that's not muted is oil, down by over one percent. We'll talk about that in just a moment uh, as you have the White House sort of, or the government asking OPEC Plus to pump more. We'll break that down, what that means for the oil price, Guy. So consumer prices very much in focus, as you say, Alex. Um, we're still getting pent-up demand, travel and restaurants. That's still keeping some elements of the inflation market, the inflation uh, that we're watching hot. Um, prices coming in pretty much where economists expected. But to be honest, this wasn't the shocker that everybody had feared. Let's dig, dig into the data because actually the, the elements here, the granularity is where the importance lies. And we'll do that with Mike McKee. Oh, thank you, Guy. And uh, this was a dog that didn't bark in a way because we got a much better than expected rate of change. And that's what we're looking at here. Uh, we had a four-tenths rise in the core and a uh, three-tenths three rise in the core, four-tenths rise uh, overall for the headline. And that is a much better than we saw the prior month. As you can see, the lines way over here come right back down. And that gives the Fed some hope that they might be on the right track. And what also gives people hope that you might be on the right track is this. We saw a number of categories over the last couple of months start to really rise in prices. I mean, just blow out. And that helped push the index up, and they have reversed. This was the base effect. Remember that when prices went down because of the uh, pandemic. And this was the reverse base effect when they went back up. And then we had a couple of months where we had high prices, and this is for used cars, airfares, and car rental, and now look what happened in this, pre in this most recent month. They have reversed. So if that's the case, then we're going to see some better news. Now, there is some thought that uh, we are just in an interregnum, that we're mm -hmm. going to see prices start rising for things like you mentioned, restaurants, because they're going to have to pay workers more. And we did see an increase in those prices in July. Does that continue? That's the question. Of course, the numbers for a year-over-year -year basis are still very high. 5.3% is, no matter how you slice it, better on a monthly basis, but not good overall. So the Fed still has something to be concerned about, something to watch. But at least, and I don't know if you can get this, Eric, but the little kink right there, that gives the Fed some hope. All right, Mike, good stuff. Bloomberg's Michael McKee. What we can learn from this guy is that I absolutely did the right thing by buying my used car in July. Thank you. I just want to say it. It's right to buy Jasper. <laughs> Jasper. Um, exactly. Okay, uh, let's stick with the whole uh, commodity theme, the uh, price inflation theme. Um, that Biden administration is calling for OPEC and its allies to boost production in an effort to combat rising gasoline prices. In a statement, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan uh, said that while OPEC Plus recently agreed to production increases, these increases will not fully offset previous production cuts that OPEC Plus imposed during the pandemic until well into 2022. At the critical moment in the global recovery, this is simply not enough. Bloomberg's Washington correspondent Anne-Marie Hordern has more. Anne-Marie, is this going to work? <laughs> it's a very good question. The timing is very interesting, uh, Alex, because we're not due for an OPEC Plus meeting in about 20 days or so, and the group just met. And as they rightfully pointed out in this statement, they have decided to bring back some of that production they had parked during the pandemic by the tune of 400,000 barrels a day in increments. Uh, what is also so interesting about the timing is the fact that this just came hours before the CPI report. And I spoke to Bob McNally, who's a former Bush energy aide, and he said this is the Obama, uh, Biden administration under immense pressure 
domestically at home when it comes to inflation, with the galloping gasoline prices being the most visible for consumers. So this does seem to be like it is a domestic push. One Russian official I spoke to, a high-level official, said that it was not polite to get involved in other people's discussions. We are polite people, and that what they see right now is that demand is fully satisfied. Amory, great stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Interesting Iran angles on some of these stories mm -hmm. as well. Bloomberg's Amory Horden joining us from the White House. Uh, staying in D.C., the Senate passing a $550 billion infrastructure plan yesterday. Uh, the bipartisan feeling, of course, didn't last long. We knew that wasn't going to be the case. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer immediately pivoting to a partisan budget resolution that will lead to a $3.5 trillion package of social spending. The Democratic budget will bring a generational transformation to how our economy works for average Americans. Joe Manchin, not happy, though. He's already vocalizing his <laughs> discontent. Let's get the latest. Bloomberg government reporter Emily Wilkins joining us from Capitol Hill. Emily, talk, talk to us about what happens next. I, Manchin's already making his views clear. How big an impact is that going to have? So let's break down exactly what Senator Joe Manchin said this morning in his statement. He said that he has concerns about the amount of the package. Right now, that's set at $3.5 trillion, but we still have a long way to go. What the Senate passed yesterday, that was just a blueprint for budget reconciliation. Now we're going to get sort of into the nitty-gritty after the House passes it later this month, trying to figure out the details, exactly how much is going to be spent. And there is some room for negotiation there to bring that amount a little bit lower which is what Manchin is pushing for. One thing, though, in his statement, and I read it several times and I did not see, is Manchin firmly coming out and saying that he would be voting against a reconciliation package. I mean, we're at the start of a process now. Uh, senators will be working on this throughout se until September 15th and possibly even a little bit later, trying to nail down the details. So once again, you sort of are in this process of negotiations, of discussions. You are seeing posturing from senators like Joe Manchin, as well as moderates in the House. But at the end of the day, no one has come out yet and said firmly that they will be voting against a budget reconciliation. It simply seems at this point that they are going to try to push to make sure that price tag comes down. All right, Emily, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Emily Wilkins of Bloomberg Government. Uh, but, Guy, what I do think this is intensely points out is that we could have trillions of dollars uh, coming over the next eight years for the U.S. economy in many different packages. I mean, that's an enormous amount of money, and that's going to dwarf sort of what the EU recovery fund is going to be, not individual countries, yep. but overall. And you really have to think, even if it goes down to two trillion, what kind of stimulus it's really going to be. Yeah, and you do wonder whether monetary policy is having much of an effect at the moment, particularly on the labor market, this could have a meaningful impact on the labor market. And I think that's kind of what you need to look at. We've talked long, long about this idea that we need a handover from, from monetary to fiscal. This is exactly what this is at scale. Yes, 100%, even if it's just $2 trillion. Um, Anyway, so that debate, obviously, ongoing. Um, but coming up, it's moderate but pacey inflation. Pacey, I feel like you should have read that tease. Guy's thing is like pacey and crunchy. Uh, Zach Pandel, Goldman Sachs, co-head of Global FX Interest Rates and EM Strategy Research, gives us his take on those inflation numbers. And what do you do? Where do you go on the curve? This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First World News. I'm Rishka Gupta. Senate Democrats have opened the way for President Biden's economic agenda. They have passed that $3.5 trillion framework that would expand federal efforts on poverty, the environment, and care for the elderly. It also includes what the Democrats call the biggest tax cuts in history for the middle class. The party line vote was 50 to 49, and it marks the start of months of debate amongst Democratic moderates and progressives over the details. Hackers carried out what is likely the biggest theft ever in the world of decentralized finance. They stole about $600 million in cryptocurrency from a protocol known as Poly Network. The network lets users swap tokens across multiple blockchains. Tens of thousands of people are affected by the hack. Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel is increasing the pressure on residents to get vaccinated. The government will expand coronavirus testing requirements for non-vaccinated people 
and those tests will no longer be free. Merkel's trying to avoid another lockdown that would put more strain on the economy. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Alex? All right, thanks so much, Ritika. So the news in the morning, CPI moderating in July. On a year-on-year -year basis, prices still rose to over 5%, but the rate of change is what's slowing. Joining us now is Zach Pandel, Goldman Sachs Global FX Interest Rate and EM Strategy Research co-head. Goldman recently cut their 10-year uh, forecast to 1.6% from 1.9%. Zach, is it possible that inflation actually is transitory? Uh, yes, it is possible, and we think it, that it's likely. Now, we want to be careful not to overinterpret any one report, as always. You know, this softer report followed a strong one last month. But we do think that inflation surged on the back of reopening, on the back of fiscal stimulus, and perhaps markets are underappreciating the extent to which inflation is going to decelerate into 2022 as the economy continues to normalize. So we would expect to see more numbers along these lines, and, and if anything, maybe a little bit lower uh, over the next few months, back to a two-tenths sort of run rate that we're used to seeing pre-COVID, pre the reopening effects. I do think we'll be seeing more of these softer prints over the coming quarters, and inflation will ultimately prove transitory. That, that's certainly our view. Zach, what does that mean for longer duration assets? Central banks, policymakers, governments have thrown everything at this. Trillions and trillions of dollars and euros and yen and pounds, and we're getting transitory inflation. What does that tell us about the long-term run rate of, of where rates are likely to be? I think it does suggest that the equilibrium or sort of normal level of rates that we're, we should expect to get used to is you know, still relatively low, not the kind of high three, four, five percent type numbers for treasury yields that you know maybe are approximate historical average. We are still in a relatively low growth, you know, low demographic growth, low inflation structural world. And we were in that world for you know the 10 years prior to, to COVID. We're not sure that the pandemic has really changed things all that much. So markets are sort of reevaluating things uh, again and uh, returning to kind of pricing that was very common prior to the pandemic, post the financial crisis, with very low forward rates, particularly low real forward rates. I think in the very distant future, it's possible that those numbers could move higher, especially if fiscal spending continues. But we should probably not expect long-dated rates to reset you know, much, much higher in an environment where the global economy is decelerating as the reopening process uh, completes. And as central bank support, quantitative easing is still mm -hmm. ongoing in a lot of places. Right. So to that point, if the Fed is going to look at these numbers, for example, and if they're right, for the doves at least, that inflation is transitory and they kind of keep things going longer than we anticipated at some point, especially if we get a lot of fiscal impulse uh, from D.C., do we get that overshoot of inflation? And if so, what do you think that's going to look like? If we get that, it's probably down the road. So I think investors should be careful to distinguish sort of two different things going on with inflation. You have the reopening effects, which are dominating the numbers uh, today, and then you have potential overheating of the economy. But that second factor is really something that's not likely to materialize until at least the middle of next year and probably beyond. You know, we're still in a place where the labor market has not fully healed. A lot of industries are still running below capacity. The U.S. economy is, is not overheating in a conventional a cyclical sense. We could get there, as you suggest, more fiscal stimulus, more rapid growth in the economy than, uh, than we are seeing, could drive the unemployment rate down faster and lead to more conventional cyclical inflation. But that's really not what we're seeing in the numbers today. I think really that's a debate for the second half of 2022 and beyond. At the moment, it's reopening effects, and we're starting to see those come out. Zach, what is having the dominant influence on pricing right now? The data or what is happening in terms of supply? Like lots of supply this week, huge week for that. I think the yield curve is really dominated by two things. One is the Fed's taper debate and when they're going to get on with normalizing the pace of uh, reducing the pace of asset purchases, when that process will wind up. Clearly, that's having a big effect on the shape of the curve. It's causing the market to price in a kind of early hike risk premia in 2022. And the other thing I think is global, it's the COVID outbreaks uh, globally. The market you know, is looking at 
what are substantial outbreaks of the Delta variant in a lot of different uh, markets, including the U.S., and pricing in COVID tail risks uh, again. So to see the market steepen again, to see rates sell off, it's probably that second piece that we'll be most focused on. When do we start to see these outbreaks ease? When do we mm -hmm. see the testing hit rates come down? That'll allow the bond market to sell off again. So that's presuming that everything in some ways opens up again and we get everything under control. Something that Guy and I have been playing with over the last couple of weeks is the idea of a stay-at-home recovery, which is different than reopening and different than a lockdown. If we're in a stay-at-home recovery kind of situation with the inflation picture that you outlined, where, where do you want to own on the curve? We still think the front end of the curve is most attractive. You know, very long dated rates, as you were highlighting earlier, are very low, both in the U.S. and globally. We still think it makes, it investor, makes sense for investors to be underweight or short the very long end of the curve, both the U.S. And, and other markets. The front end of the curve, though, we think is more attractively priced. We don't think the Fed is going to be hiking next year. There still is a decent chance of that price into the curve, about a one in three chance that they hike next year. So if we had to receive a point on the curve, we still think it's the front end. Central banks probably gonna be a little bit slower to tighten than is currently discounted. Back end rates though, we still think can, can back up fairly meaningfully. There seems to be growing dangers in the German economy. China, Delta, we talked about that. How big a gravitational impact are Bunt's having in terms of the treasury market right now? Uh, well, the global yield environment definitely is one of the factors holding down uh, U.S. Treasury yields. I think it's important to emphasize that you know, longer dated rates are really a global market. You see very high correlations across the U.S., Japan, Germany, really all developed market economies see their rates trade very closely together. So it's a common global market. Low rates in Germany, low rates in other major economies do hold down the Treasury market. And so I do think that that means for Treasury yields to set much higher, you know, back to levels that were common, say, in the 1990s. We need a different global environment. We need European growth, Japanese growth to reset higher, such that U.S. Treasuries don't look quite as attractive as they do today to international investors. We're not quite there yet. We do need to see a global recovery to get a more complete sell-off uh, in the Treasury curve. Not quite there yet. <laughs> Maybe a little bit further off. Zach, thanks very much indeed. Always appreciate your input. Greatly appreciated. Zach Pandel of Goldman Sachs. Uh, what are we going to be talking about next? We're going out of this world, or almost out of this world. Virgin oh. Galactic's downgrade. Morgan Stanley, Alex says, it could lose momentum from the grinding of its sole mothership. More on that story next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash to look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Rishka Gupta. Google reportedly will cut the pay of some employees working from home by up to 25%. That's according to Reuters. An internal salary calculator showed that those with long commutes faced losses. For example, a Google employee living in Stamford, Connecticut, who works in New York City, could be paid 15% less for working from home. A colleague living in New York would see no pay cut. A warning from Southwest Airlines. It says the recent surge in coronavirus cases is hurting U.S. bookings and may make it hard for the airline to generate a profit in the third quarter. This month, Southwest has seen a slowdown in close-in bookings and an increase in cancellations. Bloomberg's learned that Boeing is in advanced talks with a newly created Indian budget airline to sell 737 MAX jets. The airline, called the CASA, is looking at operating a fleet of 70 jets within four years. An order for 70 of the most popular 737 MAX model would be valued at $8.5 billion at sticker prices. But discounts are common for those large orders. And that is your latest business flash. Alex Guy. Rilika, thank you very much indeed. Morgan Stanley uh, <laughs> sees the planned shutdown of Virgin Galactic's main spacecraft. It's basically in maintenance uh, as another reason for a loss of momentum. It's basically cut the stock to underweight. It basically sees a lack of catalysts for this business right now. Dave Wilson, here with the details. Thanks, Guy. And you're talking about the second cell equivalent rating on Virgin Galactic since it went public by combining with that blank check company in October 2019. The first came at the end of June from Bank of America, which had given the stock uh, an underperform rating uh, after uh, having initially put it at buy. 
Now, it's been exactly a month since Virgin Galactic uh, put its founder, Richard Branson, uh, into space. And since then, I mean, the shares have really come down. They're off 44 percent. Uh, and now you have Morgan Stanley weighing in and contributing to that decline, uh, as you mentioned, lowering the shares to underweight from equal weight. Uh, and analyst Christine Lewag, I mean, she's looking at a long-term valuation of $25 a share for Virgin Galactic. It's trading at $27 and change as we speak. Now, you know, she points out that there's a flight expected in September. And then after that, the, the sole mothership called the VMS Eve is supposed to be grounded for an eight-month enhancement period. So no flights until the summer of next year. Uh, analysts definitely are turning more negative on the company. And uh, what we're seeing out of Morgan Stanley is part of that. Hey, Dave, is there any other true competitor to Virgin Galactic? Like, I hear what the analyst is saying, but if you want to invest in space in a public company, I mean, then you're looking at like a, a Lockheed or a Boeing that has a bazillion other business units uh, that can dilute that pure play. Are there other pure plays there? Yeah, not that are public, really. I mean, you think about uh, Jeff Bezos's company, Blue Origin, which maybe is the closest in terms of space tourism. You know, that's Bezos's company. It's closely held. And then you figure in SpaceX, also closely held. Elon Musk's uh, space business. So, you know, there really isn't much of a comparison. And, you know, this is a company, when you look at Virgin Galactic, that is at least trying to sort of dig itself out of a revenue hole even in the absence of flights so far. I mean, last week, they raised their prices to $450,000 a seat from $250,000. So you're talking about an 80% increase. Oh, when they had this designation for astronauts and researchers, $600,000 a seat. I mean, that feels inflationary. Uh, Dave, thanks very much, <laughs> uh, Bloomberg's Dave Wilson. So, Guy, also, if we want to stay in, like, the flying stuff space, uh, Joby is listing today. It's trading. It's up 15%. It's basically a bet on air taxis. The company started about 12 years ago, and it's looking to kind of put an air taxi in the sky by 2024. That looks nice. They got one parked outside the NYC, I think, uh, which is certainly piquing a lot of people's interests. Um, and potentially we're heading for a world where you could see a lot of the buildings in New York having VTOL ports basically mm -hmm. put on their roofs. You could go up to the top floor, get on one of these things, get out to JFK, get out to LaGuardia. That's the future, apparently. Yeah, I guess, and there's two things. One is that in terms of manufacturing these things, there are other companies that are going to be doing that as well. So, you know, yeah. how does that actually work for them? And also, you know, regulation. Ouch. Anyway, we're going to talk uh, to the executive chairman of Joby in the next hour, Paul Sciarra. Uh, so don't miss that. Coming up, price pressures on businesses. Some may be easing, some are not. We're going to discuss with the CEO of a company that owns middle market consumer and industrial businesses. Laya Saibo of Cody is next. This is Bloomberg. Megat's share price currently now suspended after that spike. As you can see, we are getting news over the last couple of minutes. The Transdime of the United States, uh, which is heavily invested into the aerospace uh, sector, which Megat obviously is involved in as well, uh, has put forward a proposal. Uh, the company has received it. It is valued at 900 pence a share. Now, before this news came out, we were trading kind of circa 787, which seems like a good number to be trading if you're an aerospace company. Uh, but Alex, as you can see, 811 doesn't look suspended. It looks like it's moving, actually. Transdime under pressure as a result of that. Yeah, and at Parker Hannafin, that stock down by almost two tenths of 1%, one of the original bidders there uh, for Megat. All right, let's turn back to that economic data and how it impacts companies on a particular level. Prices are rising. The pace is slowing. What does that do to companies on the ground? Joining us now is Elias Sabo. He uh, is CEO of Cody. Cody invests in middle market consumer and industrial companies. Elias, it's always good to talk to you. Um, where are you noticing the biggest price pressure right now, and how transitory do you think that that is? Well, first, Alex, thank you for having me on, and uh, thank you, Guy. Uh, you know, we are seeing price pressures really across the board. I think it, you know, started out with some commodity inflation earlier in the year. That feels like it's starting to subside a little bit. Um, but today, what we're facing mostly in really two acute areas, one is on the labor side, 
You know, we all saw the headline number yesterday of jolts over 10 million for the first time in history. I can tell you we're feeling that. Uh, we have more job openings than we've ever had. So we have overtime that we're working, costs are escalating there. And then probably even equally as bad is the supply chain disruption that we have. As I remind people, you know, we may have a vaccine here in the US and in Europe, but the world you know, doesn't have access to the vaccine, especially where we're manufacturing as mm. plentiful as we do. And it's creating a lot of supply chain problems. And we're just having big issues getting uh, manufactured goods coming in right now and prices are rising as a result. There is this certainty, though, amongst central bankers, Elias, that this inflation is going to be transitory, that the effects that we're seeing at the moment are going to fade. Do you see any sign of them fading? Well, Guy, we don't see any signs yet of them fading. And I'll tell you, I think the supply chain problems hopefully will start to recede. I do think as the rest of the world reopens, that is a possibility. My biggest fear is on the labor side. We're having a very difficult time attracting labor. People are not wanting to come back to the same jobs that they were doing before for the same pay. Uh, pay is rising quite rapidly, and it feels like you know the pay increases are more sticky part of inflation, and that that may not be as transitory as what we're uh, being told by the Fed. Uh, Elias, how much have you had to raise wages. I know it's difficult because you operate in different areas, but do you have an average of how much you've had to do it to get people back into the office or even quite frankly to keep them there? Yeah, it's, you know, it, it is different, Alex, by company right now and it's different by position. Um, so I can't really give you a specific number. I would say, you know, we're pulling out all stops. We're giving signing bonuses in some companies. We're getting referral bonuses to employees. Um, we are making spot bonus payments uh, across our portfolio. So, you know, I don't have an exact number to give you because it does vary and because we have so many different categories. Um, but the, you know, the, raise, the rise in wages, um, you know, is more than what we've seen on an annual basis probably in the last 12 or 13 years. Wow. Is it that the people coming through the door, and those are incredible numbers, the people coming through the door there aren't enough of them, or the people coming through the door don't have the skills that you need? Yeah, so I think, Guy, it's really more there's not enough of them right now. Um, you know, because we have job openings across all different functions in our company. It can be white collar jobs, IT jobs are very hard to secure, finance jobs are hard to uh, procure right now. But it's also in warehouse locations and it's in manufacturing locations. So, you know, those are skills that you would think uh, should be, you know, readily available because a lot of those were uh, displaced during the uh, pandemic. So we're just seeing it so broadly across all of the different job functions. It feels more like there's just a lack of available labor coming mm -hmm. through the door more than a skills mismatch right now. Elias, when you talk about spot bonuses, having to raise wages, et cetera, are you okay with that? Like, have your margins taking a hit? Are you able to, what, what are you able to pass through? What do you have to eat? Yeah, so we're passing through a large majority of all of the costs, Alex. Hmm. I think when you think about our margins, we have the benefit of demand being incredibly strong right now. And so we're getting operating leverage in our business that can absorb and offset some of the rising costs. But at the same time, we have to pass through, you know, a large chunk of these rising costs to protect margins. You know, if we went back into our second quarter, we guided at the end of our first quarter to our investors that we thought there could be some margin pressure. Um, we were largely able to offset that through both price increases and through uh, operating leverage. And our subsidiary management teams just did such an exceptional job. We were able to preserve yeah. our margins and our Q1 EBITDA margin of 20% carried through to the second quarter. Um, but we're largely passing it through. And I want to you know, make mention, our customers are accepting it. And they're accepting it because they're seeing it so broadly throughout all of their vendor base uh, that it's not a surprise to them when they see these price increases coming through. Elias, final quick question. You're not mandating vaccines at the moment. As Delta continues to surge, are you reviewing that? Do you think it could change? 
Yeah, right now, Guy, we've uh, decided, we strongly encourage it first, and we're big proponents that everybody should get a vaccine. Um, we think that it's good for society, obviously. The more people that are vaccinated, we get to herd immunity, obviously, and that will help with killing these uh, variants that are coming along. But we also believe that it's the individual's choice and we don't want to overstep uh, their personal freedoms in making the decision whether they want to get the vaccine or not. Elias, it's always a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed for being with us today. Elias Sabo, Cody's CEO. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, coming up, we just saw the US Senate pass the infrastructure bill. Uh, we're going to look at how that opens up investing opportunities in the tech landscape. Ashley Evans, Carlisle Managing Director for TMT, Technology, Media and Telecom. Joining us, this is Bloomberg. Fresh records, U.S. stocks are up, European stocks are up. Um, basically, this on the back of the CPI data that kind of pointed to the idea that maybe actually the inflation rate is going to moderate. Uh, Anna Hahn joining us now from Wells Fargo to give us her take on what is happening here. Uh, she's an equity strategist over there. Anna, I, you pivoted to the low vol trade earlier this month. We have seen yields pick up a little bit off their lows, kind of 112 up to the kind of 130s. But nevertheless, did today's number kind of confirm the validity of that call? It's certainly one of the factors keeping yields, you know, lower than you would expect in such a reflationary or cyclical and recovering economy. It was interesting to see the numbers. Like you said, it gives a sort of a hint. It slowed down from last month. And if it's slowing down, then it's not ripping out of control. It gives justification for the Fed to delay tapering. I think that's also weighing on yields today. So is that a green light then to continue to buy growth and tech? For us, actually, we don't prefer the growth in tech trade because we think that there are concerns with it. And longer term, we don't want to jump in, jump out of a trade that we don't find at a very good price. The valuations in the growth trade are still too high for us. But rather, like I was mentioning, the low vol trade to us provides that better protection profile against lower yields. At the same time, the valuations there have been cheap. These sectors sort of left behind in this big rally we've had over the past 12 months. So we prefer recommending that and using that to barbell our portfolio with cyclicality. You mentioned you think that the Fed could maybe push the taper out. What kind of timeline are you thinking about? Our projection has been that they start talking about it end of year, but it really starts getting going by the beginning early next year. You know, for the Fed, they've been very good at communicating to the markets, keeping people informed, calm as possible. And I think they're going to take their time. There is some suspicion maybe we'll hear some taper talk at the Jackson Hole coming up. But for us, I think that's going to be more of a non-event. We're not really going to see tapering heat up until the end of this year. At that point, when we start to see the tapering conversation heat up, do you then expect volatility? I mean, we're also trying to get a sense of when the Fed starts to taper in whatever way that they do, can they keep control of the market? Well, I sure would hope so, Alex. You see how that they've tried to keep equities, at least equities, moved higher. They seem to be pretty orderly these days. Even with credit markets, you're seeing some winding, but nothing where it's a shock to the system. I think as long as the Fed continues to communicate, keep in mind, if we're tapering, it's because it's good news. It's because the economy, both on the inflation side and the job side, is signaling to us that we are ready to remove the training wheels off the bicycle here. But of course, as always happens, when we take away those training wheels or accommodation, we might see some weeble wobble. But I think longer term will be a good sign for the markets. Yeah, you always get a sore back when you take the training weeble wheels off wobble. as well, certainly if you're a parent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about the economic cycle. There are many, Anna, that have suggested that this is an economic cycle that is moving at warp speed and that as a result of which everything's going to happen super fast. Your suggestion may be actually that the data is beginning to tell us that maybe actually the cycle is a little bit more elongated. How does that change the narrative in terms of the areas you want to look at and how long this equity updraft is going to last for? No, that's a great point. You know, when we were first recovering from what happened last year and we just had this standstill of an economy to where we are today, that recovery has been aggressive. 
rapid. But like you said, the pace is being moderated mostly because we've had some speed bumps along the way. You've seen that supply chains are getting knotted. We're having resurgence in COVID cases, concerns about the variant. And you've seen that internationally, there's still other factors that are weighing us and pulling us back. In that sense, we think actually that perhaps GDP growth, the potential amplitude for growth may be a bit lower, but in that sense that it's being a longer cycle. Rather than burning hot and quick, we think that's becoming a little more of a steaming and a longer cycle. And that helps us position more longer in this consumer services trades and take advantage of the companies that have cash and who are willing to spend that cash, for example, and buy back. All right, thanks so much, Anna. Really appreciate it. Anna Han, Wells Fargo, uh, securities equity strategist. So you got an equity strategist that thinks that tech is too expensive. So let's get the private equity take. Joining us now for more, Ashley Evans, Carlisle Managing Director in Technology, Media, and Telecom Group. Technology is Carlisle's largest sector by capital deployed. So Ashley, if anything, parts of the private market is even more expensive. How do you find value in the tech space right now? Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Thanks so much for having me here. I'd say private equity is really a micro business. We're looking at the fundamental dynamics of a given company and sector to understand the value that they're delivering to their customers, to their customers' customers at the end of the day. And we're finding lots of compelling opportunities, even this, in this environment. We've been investing very consistently through the pandemic. Uh, you know, what we really love and what we're looking for is how are software companies helping do their helping companies their customers do business better right what is the compelling product market fit that helps them that with the processes that are specific to the industries they serve whether that's healthcare industrial financials government or how are they making sales hr product functions work better it's a really powerful thing at the end of the day it's how software is changing the world Ashley, good morning. It's Guy in London. I'm sure you've got a whole range of screens that you run over these companies. But what are those screens telling you about where valuations are? That's what everybody's trying to get to grips with right now with the tech sector. Is there value there? Clearly there is innovation, but is it being matched by the valuation? What are your screens saying? Yeah, no, we, I mean, we think about this all the time, as you would imagine. And I'd say what we've been investing in technology businesses for 30 years and the pace of change we're seeing now around the adoption of new ways of doing business is just much faster than what we'd seen before. And as a result of that, I think there are very compelling areas to, to find value in software. You do need to look at the micro and at the specific company to, to find that value. But uh, the pace of change does, in a lot of cases, justify valuation, the valuations that we're seeing. So can you give me an example uh, of a company that does that, that sort of accelerated the kind of trends that we've seen that also then takes advantage of this hybrid model that we're seeing that still has good value? So it's a lot to try and figure out. <laughs> Yes, yeah, sure, sure. So we invested prior to the pandemic in a business called HireVue, which does video interviewing, virtual interviewing, and it's on demand. And on demand is important in two ways. One, at least two ways. One, it, it's uh, it uh, helps you. It helps more people get access to an interview. And prior to the pandemic, that was you know maybe something people wanted to do as as an aside. And in the case of the, dur during the pandemic, people realized it was a business continuity need. Coming out of the pandemic, folks are realizing that the, inter that the, the process of I interviewing virtually you know, is a really powerful way uh, to drive efficiency, bias elimination, effectiveness of the interview through the structured interview. And, uh, and that in that company, HireVue, our interview volumes are up 70% year over year as a result of the labor fluidity Anna was talking about earlier, but, but also, uh, you know, also some of the dynamics uh, around adoption. Hmm. Ashley, what is your sense of, of how much has changed as a result of the pandemic and how much has simply been accelerated? Have we seen something new or is this just a continuation of a series of trends that were already in train? Yeah, I do see the dynamic as an acceleration of trends that were already in place. And I, the reason that I see it that way is a lot of the innovation and in these companies existed prior to the pandemic. The challenge that, that happened in a lot of cases was adoption of technology as a human decision. It's a, it's a series of micro human decisions. 
what, a, what humans learn have learned over the last 18 months is that they can do things differently. And that openness, that adaptability, the resilience uh, our economy and our companies have, show, have shown is leading to greater adoption of technology mm -hmm. you know, here. And uh, you know, we're seeing real change. Um, Ashley, what's the next kind of catalyst here? Um, Guy and I have been kicking around the whole stay-at-home recovery thing. You're in the office, we're in the office, but a lot of people are not, a lot of people are getting pushed back. Everyone's getting in on that trend. What's going to be the next catalyst for you and the type of company you think will benefit from this next phase? Yeah, the the I think we are going to all going to have to continue to adapt, right? Uh, and and we I think the folks have seen that uh, that improvement, uh, you know, that adaptability over time. I think personally, I think that that adaptability is actually going to drive a new approach to to work, uh, right? As I was saying before, if we can if we can do things if we've proven to ourselves that we can do things differently in the past. Let's keep doing them differently. Let's let's keep innovating and changing. And I think there's a lot of power in that. And that, that you know, the future is going to be better than the past for that reason. Ashley, where's the innovation coming from? Is it coming from the States? Dare I say, is it coming from Europe? Is it coming from Asia? Where are you looking? We look everywhere. We're a global firm, and we look at you know, we look in a lot of different areas. I'd say, you know, there's a uh, one of the trends that I'm really interested in, and we've invested a lot behind is the use of data to power software. So historically, software was very much about workflow automation. And now, you know, we're, we're seeing uh, that as, as people are bringing data assets and the commercialization of machine learning and artificial intelligence is coming to bear, there's, there is a powerful democratization of, of data. You know, we've, uh, we've invested in a number of data businesses and, and are seeing a lot of power uh, in, in that in that platform. Ashley, great to speak with you. Thank you very much indeed for spending some time with us today. Ashley Evans of Carlisle. This is Bloomberg. We're not a supermarket. We're not like, you know, this is the flavor. I got one of those flavors for you. So, you, you, look, we, we, we just raised a substantial amount of money. We want to invest it in a disciplined way, doing what we do. It's not all about, you know, a little here, a little there, right? So when we look at SPACs and we, and we say, you could raise 200, and, and by the way, we get the pitch, <laughs> right? The bank has come to us to pitch it. But it's like, why bother? Why, why are we getting distracted with all this when we've got a pretty good opportunity in front of us here to do what we do? Do you think SPACs are a legitimate vehicle for special situations? Uh, I don't think so. How come? Uh, I, I, I think, I, do you know what I, I, I'll tell you what I think SPACs are, a good, uh, are good for. If you have an investment where some tech investment or something where you can make a lot of money or you can lose it all, right? A SPAC is interesting. Now, if you look at some of our industrial businesses, some of our old economy businesses, the only way a SPAC gets to buy into those is by paying more than a full price. And when you pay more than a full price, hey, uh, it's going to be tough to kind of dig yourself out of that, right? So, so SPACs to invest in distressed deals, special situation deals, generally, I'm not saying never, generally, I just don't see what happens. But if you're going to invest it on something which could be 10x or zero, yeah, I, 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 think, I, I think maybe there's a role for it. it. That's just not us. It's not us. That was Victor Kosla, Strategic Value Partners founder and CIO, speaking to Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker. So, Guy, he may not be into SPACs and think it's a legit way. I think that Jody might think differently. That stock now listing uh, today after going public via SPAC, uh, doing quite well. And that's all about betting on those flying taxis. Well, I guess that is, this is the ultimate special purpose vehicle, but I guess they want to yeah. make it ubiquitous. Nice one. Um, that was that good. Is what that we're was really good. About. That was really good, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I thought that. Yeah, nice that, work. Yeah. That happened by accident. Um, <laughs> believe you knew me, not by design. This is what we're talking about. So here's my big question. Mm. Uh, we're going to be speaking to Paul Sciara of Joby. They're, they're in, they want to scale this. They want to make these things um, basically become 
as cheap as taking an Uber, as easy to take as an Uber. Uh, it's going to have a range of around 150 miles. Uh, you're going to be able to use them all over the United States as long as the regulators clear it. However, a battery technology is going to evolve. Everything's going to evolve. But to get these things clear for regulatory, for regulatory clearance, and we're looking at a live shot outside the New York Stock Exchange where we'll be shortly, is the FAA going to require them to add weight? And how big an impact is that going to have? We will find out in the next hour when we meet the company. Also in the next hour, Mark Dowdy, Blue Bay Asset Management. We're going to talk CPI next.